Welcome again to another session on pediatric fractures. Today we're going to focus on fractures of the immature knee. And because of this, we need to understand how do these injuries, they're very common, knee injuries are very common in the adult, but how do they differ? Um, so children have open growth plates? Yes, and, and how, what, how does that affect the failure process if you have an acute valgus injury? It tends to fail at the physis rather right. than the ligaments. That's right. In the adult, the failure occurs mostly in the ligaments. And we hear all kinds of stories of big athletes tearing their ligaments or stretching their ligaments. But in the child, it fails where? In the physis. That's right, because the, the tension and uh, the ability to resist tension forces is less in the physis than in the ligaments. Okay, now we have this little eight-year-old that fell from a bicycle. What kind of fracture is this? How would you, you're in the emergency room and you're calling your attending staff, and how would you describe this? A uh, distal femur fracture? Yes, but how else? Where in the distal femur? It'd be apex anterior. Yes, well actually, yeah, apex anterior, but where in the bone? Uh, the metaphysis? Well, actually, the metaphysis is actually a supracondylar fracture, just like they are in the upper extremity. So, what's the problem with this fracture? Well, what, what do you have to worry about? Well, let's look. There's some muscle forces attached here. What originates, what are the main muscles that originate on the posterior aspect of the distal femur? Your gastroxoleus. That's right. And what's their effect? they um, will flex at the knee. That's right. So when you apply traction, if you're going to treat these, you're going to reduce it and you apply traction, what happens to that distal fragment? It'll extend. Yeah, right. And that's what this one here, uh, actually we went back a little bit posterior, but most of them will extend because you have uh, this portion here. And if you're going to treat it in traction, what do you have to do? How do you have to control? What do you have to resolve, um, react to? What kind of what kind of ro what kind of motion is occurring in this distal fragment? Uh, the extension. Is it's a rotation motion. Yeah. So they have to to re do this. We don't do this much anymore. But if you want to treat this in traction, you have to have two point fixation, as you can see here. So if you apply them in traction then you can control the rotation as long as you have two points. If you only have one point, it'll rotate around that one point. So you can put one in the epiphysis and one in the metaphysis. How else can you try them? These are the deforming forces, as you said, it's the gastrocnemius that pulls that when you apply traction. So here's an ambulatory technique that you can use. And this patient here, she's a very happy ambulator. And you can see um, she has the fixator on there. And <clears throat> so what are the downsides of this treatment besides pin tract infection? What does it tie up? The IT band? That's exactly right. And if you tie up the IT band, what's, what can't they not do? They have pain when they flex. And That's extending. right. It's very difficult to flex. So you need to warn them that they're going to walk stiff-legged for a while because you're tying up the IT band. So that's one downside of an external fixator. Here's another patient with this injury. What do you see here? You see an extension? Yeah, that's right. Injury. This is a classic picture where you have the fragment extended. How else can control this, how would you control it today? Because now we don't put these people in traction. Can you control it with a cast? You'd have to put it in almost 90 degrees of flexion. They wouldn't tolerate that. It probably wouldn't help. What, would you, what can you do? Um, you could do plate or... Um, well, there's not much here. Do you want to put a plate across the physis? No. Well, some people do, and then they take it out mm -hmm. after the fracture's healed. If there's a big enough fragment in the metaphysis, you can do screws. That's right. How many do you have to put again? Two. Two, that's right. 
And this, of course, you can see that he's pretty well, the ship is a she, she was pretty well aligned in the coronal plane. And uh, you can see this, so this really, you just have to deal with the sagittal alignment. And you just say you want to put a fixator on it. And where are you going to put the screws? Uh, you need two points of fixation above and below the physis. That's right. You can put it above and below the physis, and then you can control this, as you can see here. You can you actually control this. There's a little bit of posterior translocation, but that will go ahead and remodel. But the big key is that you have controlled the rotation. But it does require two-point fixation. And here it is on the metapsis and one through the epiphysis. If you put more than two screws in the epiphysis, one of them is going to probably be in the joint. And it's very important that when you put this screw in the epiphysis that you get right in the center because the joint capsule comes posterior and a little bit anterior. And if you put it in the joint, you can get a chance of infection. Okay, is this a good alternative? The use of the distal physis. Here's the fracture. What else can you use? If you can fit um, smooth pins. Yeah, you can cross pins. But what's the problem with that? What kind of structure do you have here? Is this you a stable? Don't cross at the physis. That's exactly right. You don't want to cross at the physis. So if you put them in there, you've got to put them at a very oblique angle so that you have separation. They must be in a very oblique injury, so you have lots of separation at the fracture at the uh, fracture site. So they're really separated distally. But it's a little difficult to do that. And you also have the problem of the pins are sticking out of the skin unless you want to close it. There's another way you can do this. You can do it anti-grade pins, and you can do it that way. Um, that's a little tricky, but that's another method that you can do um, and have them cross above the fracture site. Is there even a better method? Flex nails? Yeah, that's exactly right. Flex nails. And how do you put them in? Retrograde or anti-grade? I'd put them in anti-grade for that's that. That's right. That's right. And so the contouring of the nail differs a little bit here. So the first nail is put in how? Well, you have it's, it's put in just like a retrograde nail, and you have the same, just single curve of it. What about the other pin, the second pin? You got to have them separated here in the distal fragment for stability. So how are you going to get that pin on the other side? You have to bend it twice. That's right, exactly right. You have to have two bends, and that's a little difficult to do. Um, if you do it before then, it's a little difficult to pass. But there's a little trick that you can do. First, you put the first nail down, and that will bring the pin here to the lateral side. And the other pin is the second pin. You bring it down about two-thirds or three-fourths, and this, this is the point of the second nail. But it's got to be medial. And so how is this accomplished? Well, what you do, first you bend the nail 90 degrees, and then you rotate it uh, uh, 180 degrees, and then that'll bring, that one, when you do that, that rotates the tip from medial to lateral. And so that's a good trick that you have, and so then you have your two-point fixation here, and you have the two nails spread. So that's a little trick that you can use for this is what the AO technique has done and recommends. And this, this way you can get good spread at the fracture site. So if need be, you can actually penetrate. If they're smooth pins, you can penetrate through the physis. It doesn't seem to be causing growth arrest if they're smooth pins. Here's another one. This one is a distal diaphyseal metaphyseal junction. And this would you don't have a lot of uh, fixation in the distal fragment and again you would manage this one with pins and you can see this patient here has a lot of good separation just above the physis. So there's another way to consider regarding stabilization. Here you have this and you can use 
a submuscular plate that you can use. You need to make sure that that distal pin is a little bit proximal to the physis. Do you know what some of the problems are with this plate? Well, what about in the future when it heal? Do you need to take it out? Yes, you do, because this right here serves as a stress riser, and we've had a number of these that if they fall, they'll fracture right here. Also, they've described if you put this fracture here, that actually it'll kind of inhibit the metaphyseal growth and the growth of the lateral portion of the physis, and they have a tendency to uh, slip into some valgus. Okay, now this is what what kind of fracture is this? It looks like a Salter Harris one. Yeah, that's a Salter Harris one. Where's the fracture line? Through the physis. That's right. This is a. We'll talk about the distal femoral physis. We've already talked about the metaphyseal fractures, but most of these occur in the physis. So, what's the common mechanism that you have for these injuries? <coughs> What were these fractures originally called, do you know? Wagon wheel? Yeah, kids would be riding and they'd get their leg caught in the wagon and so they were called wagon wheel injuries. Now, what's the most common cause? Uh, sports? That's right, exactly right. Sporting events are the major cause of these type of fractures. <clears throat> so, what are some of the anatomical factors that are determining the prognosis on these fractures? Um, as you can see here. If you have a valgus stress, it opens up at the physis. And you have the, where are the ligament insertions? And that's totally a epiphyseal. Where is it on the tibia? Um, I yeah, it's mostly metaphyseal. So the tibia is kind of protected because it's distal to the physis. So the forces are applied to the metaphysis rather than the physis. But up here it's attached to the epiphysis and so the, the failure force is right there. Now, <clears throat> what are mammillary processes? They're extensions of the physis that kind yeah. of go up to the metaphysis. Yeah, and what, what's their major um, effect? Why do you see them in the distal femur? They're to add stability. That's right, because there's a lot of tension stresses, they, they add stability, they stabilize the physis. What's the downside? Um, they can get disrupted when there's a fracture and then that will cause... Um, yeah, well we see a lot of fractures, the physio fractures, but they don't arrest. Why is it they arrest here? Hmm. Well, it's because they go through the, the uh, since there's the memory processes, you actually go th have a higher instance of the fracture line going through the resting stage or the growth stage rather than through the hypertrophic stage that causes that. So, how do you classify these injuries? The Salter Harris? Yeah, well, but what does that tell you? Just the pattern. That's right, it just tells you the pattern. It does it tell you much about the, uh, the treatment. Not really. Yeah, most of these physical injuries, that's right, it doesn't really tell you a lot about, it only directs the method of stabilization. Um, so, how do you classify them? Based on displacement patterns. So what two major displacement patterns do you have? Um, as far as varus valgus or flexion extension? Is yeah, that that's exactly right. There's two major types. There is, there is medial lateral in the coronal plane or there's anterior, posterior in the uh, sagittal plane. You can have that, and sometimes you'll have a, actually a combination of both. So, what's the end implications regarding the etiology? These are usually a result of sporting events. What about the anterior, posterior? Trauma. Yeah, they're usually severe trauma to, to call that. So, what about complications? Which one is more likely to have vascular complications? The coronal plane. Yes. Well, actually, uh, there's less risk of neurovascular, but here, remember that the uh, geniculate arteries tie the vessel down to the distal metaphysis and physis, and so there's not much 
uh, movement here. And so that sharp spike can actually uh, impinge on the vascular supply. So what about age? Does it really make a factor if it's younger and you have a growth arrest? You have then their deformity will be more severe? That's right, that's right. There's greater effects of the growth arrest. As they get older, say the patient is 15 or 16, has a growth arrest. There's not as much of a problem because right. they don't may have may not be growth. need to be treated. There may just be, it's pretty well closed down and there, there doesn't need to be treated. So, you're gonna, the patient comes in with a swollen knee, he was playing football and he got hit from the side, it was clipped, and he's got a swollen knee, and what's your suspicion here? Um, <clears throat> you would first want to do an exam on him? Yeah, right. So, what's your suspicion? He's got some fracture there, mm -hmm. and so you do a clinical exam, and where are you going to find most of the tenderness? Um, around the knee. Yeah, but around the knee, where around the knee? Well, it's going to be mostly at the at the physis. And once you do your clinical diagnosis and you have a presumptive diagnosis, what's the second step? Get an x-ray. Yeah, and what's the purpose of an x-ray? Um, to, to it's mainly to remember, uh, it's really to, you, you made a clinical diagnosis based upon the history, and the physical examination, and you need to confirm it, and that's where you use x-rays. So, the elements of the clinical exam, that is displaced, they'll have a deformity, and they'll have certainly local tenderness over the physis. If it's non-displaced, some of them are non-displaced, or some of them get displaced and, and uh, reduce spontaneously. Uh, when it opens up, what does it cause when you open up that? Uh, physis there. You have a periosteal... Um, yeah, where well you get a lot of hemarthrosis because it's you opened up the metaphysis. And what's the most important aspect of the initial exam, though? You, you need to document. Neurovascular status? That's exactly right. You always do a very thorough neurovascular exam and because that will tell you the, the urgency of how you have to treat it. Also, if it changes after your treatment, that may uh, pretend that you have some problems. So, you're, what are you going to order first? Uh, AP and lateral of the knee? Yeah, plain x-rays. And if it's displaced, the diagnosis is usually clinical apparent, and actually all it does is just confirms the displacement pattern in the Salter Harris type. Okay, what if it's, it's a fracture, but if it's non-displaced? You can do a stress x-ray. Yeah, and one can expect a warning. The findings may be a little occult. Here's a seven-year-old with a painful swollen knee. And what do you see on the x-rays? Do you see Not any fracture? Huh? It looks okay, I don't see yeah, anything. Yeah, that's right, there's no displacement, no fracture seen. So what's your next step? A what? stress x-ray? Well, you can do a stress x-ray, but that's kind of painful, and there's another simpler way. A CT scan? You can do that. It's pretty expensive, but there's one other thing. Well, you know there's more to x-ray than the bones. What do you need to look at? The soft tissue. That's exactly right. And what, you know, we talk about fat pad lines in the supraconal fractures. Are there fat pad lines in the, here? Yeah, yeah. there's fat pads in the soft tissue. The, the deep soft tissues, the, the vastus medialis and lateralis, there's usually some fat overlying that. And here you can see the, the normal lines. What's happened here? Looks like they're displaced. Yeah, that's displaced. And why are they displaced? Because of uh, swelling. I know that, that they're displaced from the swelling, but why, what caused the swelling? The fracture. The okay, and what happens at the fracture? Um, it bleeds. bleeds right? Yeah. And that's a good sign that there's probably an occult fracture there. Now, what does this tell you? Does this confirm anything? You have him lie there for about 10 minutes and then you get this cross table lateral. Does this help your diagnosis? What do you see there? See an effusion. 
Yeah, you see an effusion, but what's unique about this effusion? This intraarticular? Yeah, how do you know that? Well, you got an effusion in the joint, and so it's intraarticular. What's unique about this, though? Well, what's this indicative of? What is the, the difference? This is a fat level right here. This indicates fat, and if you have fat, what does that tell you in the blood? Where does the fat the, come from? From the marrow. Yeah, from right. Marrow. So that tells you that there was something from the marrow. And what about fat? What's its gravity effects? It'll be superficial to the... That's water. right. It'll float. That's right. Also, it has a little bit different density, soft tissue density, to normal x-rays. This is soft tissue muscle, but the fat, as you can see here, has a different density. It's not as radio-opaque as the other soft tissues. So that's a fat, intraarticular fat, which helps also to confirm that this is a fracture. Now, you've done all this and you want to really make a diagnosis of where that fracture is, what would you do next? What would you do next? What's the best way to tell the, the, the really look at the effects? The CT scan? Yeah, you can use a CT. Now this is the old days when we had polytones and you can see here, and you can use a, and this is the same, this was the old CT, but a CT will help you a lot, that's right. And of course, the painful swollen knee, what about this patient? He had a very swollen, tender knee, what do you see on the x-ray? There's a little fragment. Yeah, okay, you see this there. little fragment on the medial side, and what does that indicate? Where, what is that? say it's most likely a Salter Harris II. Yeah, well, actually this is a normal finding. This is where the adductor magnus attaches, and this is a normal finding. The only problem was he wasn't tender immediately, he was tender laterally. So what would you do to, to confirm your diagnosis or look at it to find out where the fracture is? You could start with the oblique view. You could try an oblique view and you didn't see much. And then the stress? Or a CT scan? Yeah, well, actually, what's, what's even better if you want to look at uh, deep in there? Well, it's only, it was lateral, and what's the gold standard for finding occult injury? Well, an MRI, and here we were surprised on the MRI, you can see he's salt hair is two type of fracture. So this is a good thing to remember in your armamentarium. How do you decide whether to get the CT or the MRI? Well, I think that the MRI is probably, that's a good question, that MRI probably is a little bit more sensitive than the CT scan. Although a CT might be able to pick that up. Uh, MRI, unfortunately, is a lot more expensive. Okay, so that gives you a definite fracture. Now, You've been wanting to do a stress test, right? <laughs> okay, this is a patient here. Uh, what do you see on these x-rays? Do you see anything? Uh, I see maybe a little widening. That's right, he's got a there. little widening, but he was playing football and he got clipped, got hit from the side and had a valgus force and the coach went out, out and said, oh my Lord, he's got a ligament injury. He's torn, it opens up, he went into more valgus and he's got a ligament injury. What do you think he had? Here he is, now here's where you do your, here's the stress view. And this, we used to do this a lot before we had CT scans and so forth. But I don't think it's that important now. Is there a place for stress films? Probably not necessary with some of the newer imaging techniques. It's quite painful to do it. And if you do it, you need to make sure you do it under a, a general anesthesia with complete relaxation. If not, you may create some kind of stress or um, <clears throat> uh, forces across there and run the risk of injuring the growth cells. So if you're gonna do it, you need to make sure that they're completely relaxed. And with that, you, you really need to have them relaxed to do it, otherwise it's very painful. Although we used to do this in the emergency room and see it open up to confirm it. What about the ligaments? Can they fail with an open physis? Yeah, 
you always need to remember, and actually there's been a good study, actually it was done at this institution uh, by one of the staff men and one of the residents, and they looked at fractures of the distal, uh, physio fractures about the knee, and they found out if you really look carefully, there are some uh, ligament injuries. Now this was a girl of about eight years of age, and she opened up, but hers was due to a ligamentous uh, destruction. So, what's the most important thing to avoid in the treatment of these injuries? Well, you need to worry about late displacement. You can get them reduced, but sometimes it's hard to maintain it, even with undisplaced fractures. And if you're going to manage them non-operatively, what's the minimum immobilization that's necessary? Maybe um, 14 days? Yeah, well, actually, you've got to mobilize the joint above and below. And when do we see most of these injuries, and what age group? Two to five. Well, no, they're really, they're more adolescent. They're sports injuries. So, they're teenagers. And you ever put a spike of cast on a teenager? They're not very happy about it. And it also is a real burden on the parents. So, we don't have a tendency to stabilize them much with it. Is all that necessary? Well, here's a patient I saw years ago, and it looked like he was non-displaced fracture. Uh, he had arthrogryposis, which means he had very little muscle activity, very low. Uh, initially, he had lots of stiffness, and he had minimal swelling, and his knee was stiff in extension. And actually, it was that way before he injured. And so I thought, well, we can just treat this with a long leg cast. And we sent him home and told him to come back in about five to seven days because we'll get some x-rays. But he didn't show up for a month. He missed his appointment. He was being treated actually by his grandmother. And it was difficult for her to come to the clinic. So now what are you going to do? This is a month post-injury. Can you accept that? Is that going to remodel? No. Not in a 12-year-old, right? So what are you going to have to do? Well, you're going to have to open it up, yeah. and what you'll find that this area here is all full of immature callus, and so you got this fragment and this fragment, so now what are you going to do? Probably hmm? use a screws yeah. or a plate. Well, you can do an open and reduction, but first place he had weak bone, and he's even weaker because of the fracture. So you were going to put a screw, you do an open reduction, well, transmetaphyseal screw, but the bone is pretty soft, so it may not hold. So this is a good place, again, do an X-fix. There's two pins in the epiphysis, which is a little tricky because you want to make sure you don't get it in the joint. So to achieve the reduction, you have to do a manipulation, right? So how are you going to manipulate this fraction? You could do traction and then a varus mold. That's right. That's exactly right. You've got to reverse the deformity. And what you did, you see, very good. You've got to, un it's really the muscles have kind of made that pretty tight. So the first thing is that you have to apply some traction. And then you go ahead and you reverse it to reduce the fragments. That's right. And if it's this kind of fracture, what are you going to do? Some traction and flex the knee. Yeah, and if you got him dorsally and you flex him, how are you going to get your x-rays? It's a little tough, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of hard on a flexed knee. It's getting AP x-rays. Now, <clears throat> is this similar to another type of fracture? We talked about this other type of fracture. Is this similar to it? The supracondylar? Yeah, very good. Yeah, it's like a, just like a supracondylar fracture. And so it's an extension type supracondylar fracture. So if it's a, that, are you going to treat, is, there, is that going to, can you use the same technique? You could immobilize it in flexion. Yeah, well, or else we'll put some pins in it. But how are you going to do the reduction? You're going to have them supine or prone? Uh, 
prone. Yeah, that's exactly right. And so what you do, you, you, you treat him just like a superconda fracture. Here you got to first apply traction, place prone, and then you hyperflex, you apply traction, and you hyperflex, and when you hyperflex, you got it reduced, and then you secure it with cross pins, smooth cross pins. Okay. Now, this, this is a very rare injury. This is a posterior, anterior, but it's posterior. That fragment is posterior. So, what do you have to do here? Well, you have to kind of unlock it. So, you, first thing you do, you apply traction. You apply traction, and then you flex the distal fragment to unlock it. And then, immobilization, you can immobilize these in extension. And this is very similar to a flexion type of superconnor fracture. And then you can mobilize them in extension. Once the fracture is reduced, can you adequately stabilize it with a long leg cast only? No. The answer is no. And I think you'll get the point here. So, here's a good example. This is a six-year-old fell off the bicycle. You're in the emergency room. You call me. How are you going to describe it? He's got a transficeal distal femur fracture that's displaced anterior. Yeah, it's an anterior displaced distal ficeal, probably a Salter Harris 1 or 2. And you think you can do sedation. So what's the fracture pattern? You, do, you just told me it's anterior or posterior. And so you think you can just put it in a cast. What happened? Didn't hold it. No. So a cast alone is not adequate. So one can stabilize it with transmetaphyseal screws or transepiphyseal screws if you have enough separation in the, sag the sagittal plane. Um, here's a good example. This is a 13-year-old playing football. How you gonna? This is what kind of injury? Soldier hairs too. Yeah, but what's the displacement pattern? You need to tell me a little bit more uh, about the displacement pattern. It's a valgus. Yeah, it's a valgus. It's a medial lateral, but it's in valgus. That's right. It's a medial lateral pattern in valgus. What's the treatment option? We could reduce it and put two screws in the Yeah, that's system. right. You got a big enough Thurston Holland fragment, that's the, what you call that big fragment, and you can actually put two. It's ideal for transmetaphyseal screws. And actually, when you have them asleep, you can then test it for ferrous and valgus stability and flexion and extension. And a lot of times, you can just put these kids in a knee brace, a locked knee brace, and start early motion. And here you can see the transmetaphyseal screws. You can see here. Now, what's this fracture pattern? A Salter Harris 3. Yeah. Okay, this is Salter Harris 3, the type of free fracture. How are you going to treat this one? That probably needs transepiphyseal. That's exactly right. Yeah, very good. It was an injury of a 12-year-old soccer player, and the treatment options, very good. It's ideal for transepiphyseal screws. And you usually use a partially threaded screws so that you have some compression. And you usually need to put two in there uh, for stability. And so you follow it. A lot of times I like to follow them with an arthrogram just to make sure that you've got good articular congruity. Some people will do arthroscopic exam. Okay, what type of fixation would be needed? We, we talked about treating this like a superconnor fracture. Sometimes the only choice you have are smooth pins. And you need to tell the parents ahead of time, there may be a growth arrest, it's 50% if it's, uh, you know, if it's uh, distal physis, it's 50%, and it doesn't seem that the smooth pins really increase that to any degree. Okay, now, <clears throat> you've done your close reduction, your stabilization, what considerations, when do you, how are you going to treat this patient? When can you start motion and weight bearing? Motion at about three weeks. Yeah, and, and what's, what, well, what's the guy? When they have callus. That's exactly right. It depends on the fracture stability. And when can you allow motion and weight bearing? 
And it's usually three weeks for when you have callus. You usually have callus at about three weeks. And so usually by the time you have some callus, you have intrinsic stability and you can put them in a hinge knee brace or something, provide a little bit of stability, but you can allow them to start motion, protected motion and protected weight bearing. Now we have some special fracture types. <laughs> Fortunately, we don't see this very often in children. And this is a gunshot wound. And <clears throat> as you can see here, and here you can see there's a lot of destruction. And there's not an awful lot that you can do for this other than to breed it and clean it. Uh, you, you, know, the, the, you need to, you can, you can maybe need to stabilize this little fracture with a very small mini screw, but this is a bad injury. Here you can see we did a close reduction. Now, you need to tell the parents and you need to be alert with fractures. Remember, a classification tells you the uh, classification tells you the structure, the treatment, and the possible complications. So, what's the incidence of growth arrest? About 50%. That's exactly right. And why is that? Um, because of the memory, memory processes. processes. That's right. And so, and, uh, and if you look at all the series, it's about 50%. And so, you need to tell the parents ahead of time that there's a high incidence that this needs to be followed. What's the other vascular injuries? It's not as much, it's only about 2%. And with late displacement, what's acceptable? What plane? Well, you can accept a little sagittal because that's in the plane of motion. Not much. You certainly don't want to do it in coronal because that's not the motion. So, when can you do a late reduction? Within two weeks? Yeah, actually about 10 to 13 days. What happens if you try to do a reduction after that? You may injure the other... Yeah, it takes a lot of force to manipulate that fracture. And so uh, you will need to... Uh, you don't like to do that later on. And you know, what you do is you just allow it to heal and then do a, a controlled osteotomy later on if you need to do that. And you must... So you must weigh the risk of growth arrest uh, versus the deformity correction. Okay, so there's more complications. What's the most common nerve injury? Uh, uh, perineal nerve is about 3%. And how often is there associated ligamentous instability? Well, the, the series that was seen at our institution and some others, there actually is about a quarter of them, a little bit over a quarter of them, will have some type of associated ligament injuries. So everybody focuses on the fracture, but there may be the ligament injuries. The fracture will heal, but the ligament injuries may need to be addressed and recognized. And some of these get irreducible. You try to reduce it. What's usually the cause? The periosteum. That's right. There's usually interposed periosteum that occurs then. And that usually occurs in the type four and type three solvent hair fracture patterns. And those usually often need to be open reduced as well. So, in summary, the pitfall is to avoid failure to ignite an acute fracture, even though you don't see it. And we looked at the, so looking at soft tissues, the fat pad sign, and of course, using a CT or uh, MRI. Inadequate stabilization, a cast will not stabilize it that we do see that some of them have unrecognized ligamentous injuries and you need to be aware of that. And again, the most important thing is that you need to tell the parents ahead of time that their growth risk, even if it's a type one or two injury. And you also need to watch them very closely because you can get acute delayed vascular injuries. Okay, now we'll go down a little bit further in the proximal tibial physis here. So, the basic facts. How common? When's the last time you saw a distal, I mean, a proximal tibial physal injury? Not very uh, often. Yeah, very rare. It's only about 1% of all pediatric fractures, it's, it's, which is fortunate. And what age group is it mostly common seen again? Adolescence? Yeah, it's because it's usually associated with sporting. 
you know, it's, it's an adolescent injury mainly because it occurs with sporting injuries. Now, how are the fracture patterns classified? Well, they usually use the Salter Harris classification with the Salter Harris 2 and 3. But <clears throat> the people in San Diego have written an article and uh, in the report in the Journal of Children's Orthopedics in 2009. And they say the real problem is that the current classification says there's just one particular type of fracture, tibial tuberosity, spine, or Salter Harris facial injury, and they don't account for the fracture patterns in the anterior and posterior plane. In these types of classification, there needs to be a provide two major benefits in the treating orthopedic surgeon. The classifications highlight the mechanism of injury, and it also provides the knowledge of which fractures are based on the mechanism and limit the number of missed injuries. So they propose a classification that reflects both the direction of the force and the fracture pattern, and that's important in your treatment. And so this is their classification. They have four basic types of proximal tibial fractures. There's a valgus injury, and this often occurs in the weaker metaphyseal bone. It goes and opens medially. And this, of course, is a varus injury, and often you have a Salter Harris II type of fracture and opens laterally. And you can have an extension injury. If you, if you have an extension injury, say they fall off a bicycle, what is a common fracture associated with this intraarticular? A tibial spine. That's exactly right. The, and the cruciate is stronger than the tibial spine. And so when you have an extension fracture, um, and actually this arrow should be the other way because it opens up posteriorly. When you do that, you stress the anterior cruciate, and so you need to look for that. And this, of course, is the tibial tubercle fracture or the proximal tibial flexion type of injury that you can see. So this is a flexion and you have anterior displacement. So this is a good classification because it tells you the direction and the cause and where the fracture pattern usually is. And so it's, it seems to be the standard now that people have accepted. Now, why, why are these injuries rare? Because the, What is it that protects the anatomical? The ligaments. The ligaments, are, yeah. And what else? What about the bony structure? Well, is it a, it's not a straight physis, it's curved. And you also have the tibial tubercle here. So <clears throat> that and the curved physis, so it, it's not as vulnerable to tension or uh, shear stresses because of this curve. Now, you talked about the ligament structure. How do they protect the tibia? Where are the ligaments attached? In the metaphysis? Yeah. Well, actually, there's one that attaches to the epiphysis, and that's the deep medial collateral ligament. That's not a very strong ligament, is it? The main one is the superficial, and it attaches to the metaphysis. And the, the, on the lateral side, you have the joints and the fibular collateral attaches to the fibula. Uh, so result is the proximal tibia physis is protected from ligament and stress. Elsewhere, the fracture pattern are classified by the direction of the fracture displacement. Again, that's a hyperextension injury. Um, and the major concern here is what? The popliteal artery? That's exactly right. Yeah, and then what you see here, it opens up posteriorly, and the epiphysis is anterior, and so the reduction process is that you flex the knee, and then usually that will put it back, push that back, and then you stabilize it with cross pins. Once it's reduced, you stabilize, you get it, uh, the posterior thing is closed, posterior gap is now closed, and you use an AP screw for the uh, tibial tubercle, and then you use cross pins for the epiphysis. Now, <clears throat> again, you told me the instance of vascular injuries, right? And so the popliteal is vulnerable. Why? What is it? Uh, it's attached at the soleus 
Yeah, thing. well, it's attached right here. There's actually an arcade, and that ties the fracture, the, the artery down so that there's any displacement. There's no wiggle room here. So if you have this, you have a, a very high instance of metaphysis pressing against the artery and inhibiting the structure, and that's why it's important. Now, the valgus injury, so what's the f unique relationship of the fibula? Why is it you get this Salter Harris II fracture? What's on the lateral side? Well, that usually goes anterior lateral, and this one goes posterior medial, and so these are the result of valgus forces, but there are some, and why is it that the ligaments don't read it? Okay. Well, the areas here, this is a, this will kind of resist compressive forces in a valgus injury, but the tension forces are still applied here. So you know, the components that you commonly have with a valgus injury, because you have a lot of ligamentous support here on the lateral side, is you have rupture of the medial collateral ligaments, and then you have compression laterally, and this can give you a Salter Harris three fracture pattern. So how are they managed surgically? You like to operate, don't you? You can do... Um, What's the first thing you have to do? Reduce it. Reduce it. Okay. What is your concern that may inhibit your reduction? Your ligaments may be... Uh, interposed, yeah. Interposed. Yeah, or the... The, the, uh, the peripheral attachment of the meniscus may be stuck in there. So, you do a closed or open reduction. Some people will do, since there's a halter series three, the articular surface is involved, then you can either do an arthrogram, or some people will do an arthroscopic assisted reduction. And the fixation is what? What are you going to use? You can do, for a Salter Harris three. you could do the transepiphyseal. That's right. Screws. Here you can see you have a Salter Harris two, and it's a valgus injury. And so what you treat it, if you got a big enough screw there, you can actually uh, use it. I've got big enough Thurston Holland fragments, you can use a transmetaphyseal screw. Or sometimes, like in this fracture, here you had to use transepiphyseal and transmetaphyseal screws. So sometimes you have to use transepiphyseal. Now, this is a flexion injury. And usually in the adolescence, if you have an acute flexion injury, what kind of fracture pattern do you have? What fails? The tibial tubercle. That's exactly right, yeah. But occasionally the whole physis will fail and you get this flexion injury. So it's rare. What's your major concern here? The anterior compartment? Yeah, the anterior compartment, or you get growth arrest or inadequate correction. So how are you going to treat this one? With uh, a couple screws across yeah, but, the... Yeah, and so what you do, you have to extend it. You extend the distal fragment, and then you apply some small cross pins, percutaneous pins, as you can see here. Here you can see it. So, here in the general treatment process, first you need to make sure you evaluate the neurovascular status before you do the treatment to make sure that you didn't alter it with your treatment process. You uh, reduce the fracture and you assess the stability. And you also, again, uh, evaluate for ligamentous injuries. And you look for joint surface congruity and you stabilize and then you follow carefully for growth arrest. So what's the instance of growth arrest in this fracture? I know it's less than the distal femur. Yeah, right, it's much less than the distal femur. It's very uh, rare, so, but it occurs about 14 to 24%. So thank you very much for your participation. You did well.